This is a quick review on the Dreadbox NIMS. I'm going to focus on all the things that I would want to know before purchasing, but this isn't going to be a tutorial or a deep dive into its functions. Sound and build quality, ease of use, how I could see this fitting into a workflow, and then I'm going to give some final thoughts about ownership. So first of all, let's talk about sound quality. Overall, it sounds great. Just by looking at the graphics, you can tell that what they're going for is a vintage or retro vibe, and it definitely has that, but also has a little bit of a modern flair to it. I posted some other videos that will give a really good idea about what this thing can do. In one of them, I use this for eight different tracks. It's the only synth used in that entire video with the exception of the drums. Granted, I loaded up each of those sounds with effects like phasers and choruses, delays and reverbs, but you still get an idea of how strong of a synth this is. I also posted another video that goes through all of the different presets. So go listen to those and you'll get a really good sense of what this thing can do. The build quality is solid. This is all metal casing and the sliders and knobs feel really, really good. I definitely get the sense that even if you dropped this thing, it wouldn't break. It also has a super small form factor. It's much thinner than I was expecting when I first got it. So if that's important to you, or if you're a gigging musician, I could see this working really well. But because of its small form factor, you do have a few trade-offs in its usability. And I think that that's important to note with this. First of all, let's take a look at the connections. It doesn't have a regular 5-pin MIDI. It uses this 8-inch jack. They did send the adapter with it, which is great. But at the same time, it's another thing that could be lost or something you have to remember if you're switching your setup a lot. I kind of wish it just had the 5-pin MIDI. It receives its power through USB, which is fine. I did have an issue when I plugged it into my computer with some low-level noise or distortion. I also tried plugging it into a jack on my mixer that's dedicated to powering things like lights or phones, and I received the same level noise. After trying out a variety of different power sources, I noticed that a phone brick was actually the best option. It was totally silent and that worked out really well. I kind of still wish it had a power adapter. Those details wouldn't have been enough to stop me from purchasing this though. But let's talk a little bit about how, how the sliders work and how easy it is to work with them. Each slider gets two functions, sometimes even more. It defaults to the bottom value, but if you hold down shift or double click it to keep it on, you can adjust the value on the top, which can be kind of challenging sometimes. If you hold down shift and adjust the top value, then there's kind of like an imaginary slider down at the bottom. So if you go to bring it down again, it jumps up to that place. So you can encounter these problems where one slider is at the top, one slider is at the bottom, and in order to change it, there's an immediate jump. It's not too big of a problem, but if you rely a lot on changing values in the middle of a set or in your tracks, then I could see it being a potential problem. One of the added features that comes in is this chord function. I honestly didn't even use it, and I probably never will. To me, they just seem harder than just actually learning and playing the chords. But even if you are someone who really does like these, these chord functions, you probably already have some sort of controller that does it anyway, like a key step 37. So I don't understand what Dreadbox was thinking by including this function here. Seems like they might have lost focus. I would have thought that the synth should be focused on the sound quality, and producing really good sounds. And chord, the chord function is more of a playability kind of thing. That should be in a MIDI controller. That's just my thought. I will never use that function, but if you like it, that might be a bonus. This also comes with reverb. And while that on the surface seems pretty cool, I didn't really like it, especially when it was longer. In fact, I ended up just turning it off on all of the tracks that I used. If you're buying a boutique synth like this, chances are you probably have some reverb plugins that you like or even some pedals or something like that. So having reverb built into it is kind of like, why? If I were them, I would have just left it off. But again, it doesn't really stop me from purchasing it because I can just shut it off. I do think it's kind of funny though because it's an all analog synth, except for the reverb. It's digital. So if you look through all the documentation, it says all analog except for reverb. And they just have to include these parenthetical statements. A lot of people in the online communities talked about menu diving and cited it as a problem. I didn't really find it that bad. Overall, I was able to get it to do whatever I wanted it to do. And the documentation was strong. And it even comes with a little 
menu map that you can use as a reference guide. The only way I could have seen them making it easier was to include a screen. And honestly, I wouldn't want them to do that. I don't want a screen on something like this. I think it's cool that we have an all analog machine, except for the reverb, that doesn't use a digital screen. When you first get it, you're probably going to want to dive deep right into the presets. And that's another kind of, eh, I didn't find them to be that usable. Check out my video that highlights all of them. There are a handful in there that I could see using in track, but overall, I'll probably just dial in my own sounds. Another thing that I thought was kind of funny is that most synths with their presets will come up with some type of fancy name like Serene Nights or Aurora Sky or something like that. Dreadbox didn't deal with that at all. They named their, their presets things like Pad Number 3. Base number four, I got a kick out of that. Regardless, it's super easy to dial in really great sounds that are usable in tracks. Preset saving and loading is very functional and not hard to do at all. 49 user banks, and I was able to come up with a number of bass sounds, pads, leads, and sound effects that I'll probably use again and again, and they're already saved to my presets. And since there's 49, I might not even fill them all up and I'll still get tons of use out of this thing. So let's talk a little bit about workflow because that's how I see this thing being used. After an initial period of adjusting sounds and loading them up into your preset bank, I probably won't spend too much time designing sounds on this. Because of the way the sliders works and the shifting, it makes it kind of hard to do sound design and you have to really focus on it. Also, since, the, since I didn't really like the presets that much, I'm going to have to spend a significant amount of time really dialing in some sounds I want and saving them to the preset banks. But once I do that, it's going to be awesome. Because of its small form factor, I can put it away and pull it out as I need those specific sounds, and they'll be saved right in my banks. That's really where I see this thing thriving. If you're looking for something that has the throwback kind of style, but is a little bit different than what everybody else is using, and at the same time, you want a nice small form factor and don't mind some of the trouble that it takes with shifting and that type of stuff this will definitely work for you you save some great sounds to the presets and spend more time on playing and composing than actually sound designing so lastly i just want to give a couple of final thoughts about ownership i don't know too much about dreadbox as a company but i did look into them a little bit after i purchased this and and i really liked their story they're from greece a very small outfit. If you look online, you can even find a tour and some interviews with some of the people who run the place. In that video, I saw that there were two people sitting at a desk making these instruments. And they seem to be friends with everybody. So that made me feel really good. They're not outsourcing labor or doing things like, you know, Behringer. You can feel good about this purchase. There's something just really cool about owning a synth that has a story like that. It really seemed like they were proud of their products and really wanted them to be the best things possible. Let me know what you think down in the comment section, especially if you think I missed something. Please like and subscribe and go make some music.